Welcome to our worship here in Christchurch Warwick in Bermuda. Always a warm welcome to all of you who come and watch this service. Uh, those members here on the island, friends, others associated with the congregation, and those who watch from other nations. A very warm welcome to you all. We're continuing with our worship in the man's garden, and this Sunday morning we will administer the sacrament of baptism. We had scheduled for Monday evening a meeting of the Kirk session to discuss, amongst other things, when we might be returning to worship here in the sanctuary. But with the impending hurricane, it's very doubtful if that meeting will take place. It will be postponed, rescheduled, and we'll keep you well informed as to when we might be returning to worship in the sanctuary. Again, a warm welcome to our worship today. Let us worship God. To the Lord belong the earth and everything in it, the world and all its inhabitants. Let us pray. Almighty God, we put aside this time as a time of worship to reflect on your being, your nature, your ways, as they have been revealed to us down through the centuries and to listen again to what it is you ask of us and of all peoples, that we might live lives that are more truthful and will enhance life, enrich it, not only our own but the lives of others. Your Holy Spirit seeks to guide us still in these ways of life and of truth, and yet too often we go our own way we can be selfish, self-censored, and sensitive to the needs of others. We can talk about our care of creation and the response to those in great need that too often our actions fail to match up with our words. And so within creation, we poison and pollute our rivers, seas, and oceans. We poison the very air that we breathe and we use the rich resources of the earth in a selfish and exploitative way. And when it comes to the care of others in their need, both those amongst whom we live and those far off, we can be lacking in true compassion and care. So before you now we ask forgiveness for the wrong we have done, the hurt that we have caused. We ask also the patience and the forgiveness of those whom we have let down. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of your forgiveness that we might feel forgiven and be more forgiving in our dealings with others. As we have been accepted, may we be more accepting. May we strive to build that type of community with the values and priorities which reflect your ways, where the most needy and vulnerable are cared for. Help us indeed as we listen to your word to grow closer to you and in so doing closer to one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue reading from the book of Exodus. Having reflected in recent weeks on Moses at the burning bush and then the escape from Egypt, the institution of the Passover. We turn today to the, the crossing of the sea. It's Exodus chapter 14, and we're going to read from verse 19. Exodus chapter 14, and at verse 19. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night. 
turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord and the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea, so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians, so the people feared the Lord, and believed in the Lord, and in his servant Moses. May God bless to us the reading of his word, and to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. I've said in recent weeks that when we consider the stories of the early part of the Old Testament, rather than dealing with history as we would normally understand it, and which in a sense only begins with the monarchy in Israel, in these accounts, in these stories, we're looking instead rather at the the forming of an identity of the of the people of Israel. A reflection, their own reflection on the on their origins and, and all that created and influenced their their very identity. And so we come today to this story, perhaps best known to you over the years as the, as the crossing of the Red Sea. Now again, in terms of historical accuracy, there will be those that are very comfortable with a literal and historical reading of the event and uh, a belief that it happened just as is recorded here there will be those who are less concerned about the, the historicity of it and more concerned with what's the meaning behind it. But you know, there's also a third group. And the third group, sadly, are those that feel that this is a, a, an account, a story that has to be read literally and historically as, as something that happened and, and find it difficult to, to understand and to accept in that way. Now, if you belong to the first group that want to read it as a historical event accurately portrayed, then you're perhaps going to be a little bit uncomfortable, what I'm going to now suggest, but in a sense this is aimed more at the, the middle group and, and the third group, those for whom it is in effect almost an obstacle to faith. Those that say when they look at the stories of the Old Testament, ah, oh, but fairy tales, and, and dismiss faith and belief itself. So let's look at some of the issues that make it difficult to accept this story in a historically accurate way. I say, first of all, it's, it's often termed and understood as the crossing of the Red Sea, and some of you will have pictures in your mind at this point, whether from illustrated Bibles or from, from films, recent and, and further back, of, of Moses holding his staff and the sea parting and great walls of water, maybe 20, 30 feet high on each side, allowing the Israelite people to to walk on dry land across it. Well, just some issues to take into account. The Red Sea, the Red Sea itself is almost 200 miles across, although at its narrowest, 
and where you might suspect it's where the Israelites would have crossed, it would be perhaps 19 miles. But 19 miles is still roughly the the width, if you like, of the of the English Channel. This is no simple river crossing. This is a great a great sea crossing. And we, perhaps we can say at the outset that the term Red Sea, in fact, is a mistranslation from the Hebrew, and you'll find in very modern versions, most modern versions, at least a footnote saying that the proper translation is, in fact, not the Red Sea, but the Sea of Reeds, a marshy area of ground <coughs> to, the, uh, to the west of the sea itself. And another obstacle to belief in reading this story literally is, is the numbers that are given in the book of Exodus for the flight from Egypt. They record that 600,000 fighting men were part of the Exodus, joined by women and children and others who accompanied them, with the suggestion that the numbers involved here are, are around 2 million fleeing from oppression in Egypt. It's been calculated that if you have over 2 million people 10 abreast, then it would result in a column 150 miles long. And it would take some seven or eight days to pass just a single point. So there are difficulties, clearly, in taking this, this story at, a, at literal face value as a, as a historical event. And it's, it's much more likely that there had indeed been a, a much smaller group of Israelites who at one time were in Egypt and may well have been captive there and escaped, but not the numbers that are in, involved here. And so instead we're, we're looking at the, the meaning, the purposes behind the telling of the story. And of course the next thing we realise is that the account that I read this morning is not just one story. This is an event which is very, very important to the people of Israel and development of their history and identity. The story that I read today is clearly comprised of, of two different sources, an early source and a much later source, an early source, perhaps 9th century BC, the later source, 6th century. And, and of course, it's followed by the Song of Moses and the Song of Miriam, rejoicing in all that God has done for his people. But if you look at even the two sources that we read from today, we'll see there are two quite distinct events. In the older source, in the older source, the people are complaining to Moses. They're encamped. They see the Egyptian army approaching them. And they say, why did you take us out of Egypt, where at least we could live instead of seeing us being slaughtered here in this strange place? And Moses assures them that God will look after them. And it's that part of the story that we read that the, the pillar, the pillar of cloud places itself between the Egyptian army and what's described as the Israelite army. And then the east wind blows. The Egyptian army, we're told, is put into a state of panic by God. They get caught in the, the waters of the of this marshy land, and they flee in panic, seeing that God is fighting for the Israelites against the Egyptians. In that account, there is no crossing of the sea whatsoever on dry land. The crossing of the sea comes in the much later account, and in that later account, it's an act of Moses, of God through Moses, with Moses holding his staff, separating the waters, allowing the Israelites to pass through, and as the Egyptian army, the Pharaoh, the chariots, the charioteers get swallowed up in the returning waters. So two quite distinct events, but used by the writers, put together to form the, the story as we, as we have it now. But read it carefully, and you'll see there are indeed two events in that. What, what does the story portray? What is the purpose What's the agenda behind it for the, for the writers, the compilers of this very significant event in the forming of Israel's history? There are perhaps three things to consider. There's the emphasis yet again that God's desire for his people is a full life and a free life. Life lived in freedom, not oppressed, not enslaved, and that God stands with the oppressed rather than the oppressor. 
It's God's delight to release his people into freedom and out of bondage. The second thing we might wish to consider is this. Again, it's an example. And this, becomes, this is very, very obvious in the Song of Moses, which follows. It's an example of the primacy of their God, the God Yahweh, against other gods. Not only the God of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but the gods indeed of their surrounding nations as their, as their history unfolds. It's setting God as a God above all, who will reveal himself and overthrow the gods of the, of the other nations. And the third thing I would take from the passage is, is this, in terms of the involvement of the sea and the, and the waters of the sea, often seen, again in the writings of the people of Israel, as, as a symbol of, of chaos and contingency, if you like. They were a desert people. The sea was a, a frightening, the ocean was a frightening place for them, a place of, of great storms, of unknown depths, and of, of sea monsters, which, which came to represent chaos, confusion, contingency, vulnerability, and, and ultimately evil. And God's power, if you like, or control over the waters, as demonstrated in this story, is again a further illustration of, of God's desire to overcome chaos and, and evil. Now, this is an important story to the, to the Jewish people today, the story of the whole story of the, of the Exodus and the wanderings in the wilderness, the, the crossing of the sea. But again, it's a story that has implications for us as well. The primacy of God. What are the gods that we are at times, alternative gods, that we are tempted to worship? and to put in God's place. Do we always feel for the oppressed as we should, rather than the oppressor? And can at times we be responsible for that very oppression? And yes, chaos. Chaos and confusion and vulnerability speaks to us in our own lives and in our lives as a, as a community, as a, as, a, as a nation. The stories therefore do not need to be taken literally and factually and historically true. But what we could reflect on and ponder on is the tremendous depth of understanding and imagery that's within them and all that they can fade to the people of Israel and which they still have the power to convey to us today. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving, our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give thanks this day that you are there for us in all the experiences of life. The times which we truly celebrate as times of thanksgiving and celebration. The good times. Times of precious memories, of, of love and of friendship shared. The times when we do indeed feel life enriched and enhanced. And in that celebration of life, you are present with us. But there are times too when life seems a struggle. When we feel our vulnerability, our lack of control of events around us, chaos, confusion, the very contingency and vulnerability of life, the uncertainty of what lies ahead, the events, the concerns that cause worry and anxiety. And again we give thanks that in the midst of that you are present with us. Present with all your people and of all nations, seeking to heal, seeking to reconcile, seeking still to lead people from oppression to freedom, out of slavery and bondage, to a full and free life. And we give thanks too for the life of Christ and his example and illustration to us of your ways and of your nature. And in his name now we offer our prayers for others. We pray for our loved ones our families, our friends, wherever they may be this day, and ask your blessing upon them. 
There are those two whom we know by name and whom we know to be in need at this time. Whatever that need, loneliness and anxiety, illness or frailty, a sense of vulnerability and uncertainty about the future, those who are worried both by day and by night, those who are struggling with financial and economic circumstances, those who have been bereaved and missed loved ones. May they know the healing touch of your spirit and may they find themselves surrounded by support and care and love and friendship. We pray too for those who govern us, for those who exercise power and indeed control over our lives. May they do so with the knowledge of your ways and purposes. May they be men and women of honesty and integrity. May their first concern be for those who are the most vulnerable and needy. And so we remember those in this your world who struggle most at this time. The victims of natural disaster, whether flood or of famine. The victims of our inability to live peacefully one with another. Those caught up in conflict and war. Those who live as refugees. Those cruelly treated by their own governments, their own people. May we all be people of integrity and reconciliation with a desire to root out that which is wrong and stand up for that which is right. We pray for your church that we may be an example to others for the life of this congregation, your church and the world. And we remember always those no longer with us but whose love we were privileged to know and to receive. Help us to know that they are never far from us, for we share a fellowship and a communion with them still, through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have in you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> And now go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and always. <laughs>